afternoon. Welcome to Bancroft Heights. My name is Andrew Noon. I'm a docent with Preservation Worcester. Again, behind me, we're looking at Bancroft Tower, which dates from 1900. It was built by Stephen Salisbury III in memory of his father's uh, dear friend, George Bancroft. George Bancroft's home stood 500 feet behind me on Salisbury Street. Bancroft, again, one of Worcester's most prominent citizens. He was ambassador to Germany, the New Germany, ambassador to Great Britain. He was uh, uh, secretary of the Navy. He founded the um, U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, and he was the most prominent American historian of the 19th century. In fact, the Bancroft Prize, which is awarded today, the most prestigious history prize is named after him. So he was a close friend of Stephen Salisbury II, and again, it was dedicated to him. Bancroft Tights uh, was a development um, brought together by Stephen Salisbury in the late 1890s. He chose this site being very pastoral in nature. Originally, it was all farmland. Really, in some ideas, it's the concept is that of a folly. A folly was a decorative structure uh, built on French or, or English estates, which would be kind of a retreating point for the uh, uh, residents when they wandered about their lands. It's a tower in a neo-Romanesque design with three irregular towers, two square towers either side, uh, all accrenelated, that means the wedging, okay? Um, the central, uh, off-center rather, cylindrical tower also, the intentionally misplaced windows. This is all part of the romantic spirit for irregularity, okay? Uh, this was built in dedication to uh, Stephen Salisbury II's um, friend, George Bancroft. So again, the um, his son is building this for the father, in memory of the father. Bancroft lived 500 feet behind me off Salisbury Street. Uh, his home uh, dated to the 18th century. It was taken down in the 19-teens, I believe, 19, early 1900s. Uh, this is obviously a very large folly. Typically, it might be half the size, although some are this large. And Stephen Salisbury and friends used to ride on horseback through the trails up to this um, Bancroft Tower in the early teens. Again, he died in 1905. Uh, again, very wealthy man when he died. He, uh, he died with an estate worth $4 million, which in today's money is $120 million. He gave three of that $4 million to the Worcester Art Museum. Baycroft Heights was developed in the late 1890s by Stephen Salisbury III, uh, the third generation of a, uh, one of Worcester's most prominent families. Stephen Salisbury came here from Boston in the 1770s, set up a hardware store and goods store at Lincoln Square. Uh, became a prominent businessman. His son, Stephen Salisbury II, uh, developed many industries in Worcester, uh, in, uh, uh, helped to um, grow several institutions in the city, such as uh, um, WPI, the American Antiquarian Society, etc. His son uh, was a world traveler, uh, also a businessman. Um, and in the late 1890s, he saw the opportunity to develop th this area called Bancroft Heights. Uh, the western side of the city. It's hard to imagine once upon a time 120 years ago, this was largely farmland. To my back right, there was um, um, an asylum and a military academy, 1850s, 1870s respectively. Uh, all the buildings were closed by the 19-teens. Uh, those properties were combined with uh, farmland to create Bancroft Heights, which was a series of 41 lots uh, upon which would be built these rather elaborate homes in the 1890s and 1900s. We're looking at what is probably the most uh, historic building in Worcester. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, this is the second Worcester County Courthouse. The first was built in the 1730s. This one dates from 1751. Uh, this is the only home in the district which was moved here. Okay, its original location was at Lincoln Square, in, uh, where it served, of course, as the courthouse. In 1800, it was moved, when the new courthouse was built, it was moved to the um, end of Green Street, Trumbull Square, and in 1899, it was dismantled and brought here piece by piece and reassembled. Um, it's an example of uh, Georgian architecture from the period. Uh, the, again, multiple chimneys, okay? It has kind of a delicate frieze above. The fan light, small side lights. Um, this is not the original doorway. The original doorway was uh, removed in the 1950s, I believe and it was placed in the back of the house. This is a new doorway. This home uh, is uh, very historic for the reason four major events, which kind of all four had an impact on American history, took place here. In uh, 1774, the uh, Worcester Patriots forced the British judges out of the courthouse, which was at the end of Main Street, and forced them to walk along through a gauntlet. 
Timothy Payne, whose house is lower Lincoln Street, still standing, had his wig knocked off. Uh, so the court was closed, and in some ways, recently, uh, historians have viewed this as really the beginning of the American Revolution, because this was actually one of the first times that British authorities were forced out of their jobs and out of their workplace. Okay? A, a new government took over the building, essentially. Uh, in 1778, Bathsheba Spooner, who was the daughter of a famous uh, Tory in the, in the state, Timothy Ruggles, hired two British soldiers and her teenage American lover to kill her husband. He was thrown into a well in Brookfield. The uh, indictment took place here. The, the trial was planned to take here, take place here, but because the, over, over, the crowd was so huge, they shifted the venue downtown to um, uh, the town hall, okay, the, the town meeting house. Uh, it was the first, she was the first woman executed uh, in America, in a new nation. Uh, when she was um, taken down from the scaffold, all four were executed in Worcester in July. When she was taken down, she was discovered to be five months pregnant, as she had claimed she was. And she was buried in Greenhill Park. In 17... 83, one of the court cases which ended slavery in Massachusetts, that of Quack Walker from Brookfield also, took place here. Uh, he, his um, owner assaulted him, he sued the owner, and in the course of the trial it was seen that, why don't, why don't we just pursue this further and make it as a, um, a claim against slavery. It was not the deciding case, but one of the deciding cases took place in this courthouse. And lastly, in the 1780s, Shays Rebellion, which was a rebellion by farmers against being overtaxed by the new government, took place here along with uh, sites in Springfield, Taunton, Northampton, and Concord. So again, a very historic building. We're taking a look at the George Minton House from 1901, the yellow home to my back here. Uh, it was designed by um, George Clemens, a prominent Worcester architect. It's an example of an, of an elegant example of uh, colonial revival architecture. Double bow uh, exterior, okay? The um, pavilion porch in front, ionic columns, fluted. Uh, both sides, uh, the modillions along the uh, frieze on the top there, uh, the alternating pediments, you have the um, triangular versus the uh, semi-lunar, okay. Uh, again, these homes also copied the, um, they're interested in copying the 18th century style of um, American architecture, so of course clapboarding was always used for the exteriors. Uh, these finials the top, the um, balustrade, were typical of the style also of um, colonial revival from the um, 1890s period. Okay. The um, wing on the side was added maybe 10, 15 years later, but it blends in nicely with the rest of the home. Uh, the, the high hip roof is typical also of, uh, again, late 18th century American architecture, as are the multiple um, chimneys that are included. Uh, probably Worcester is best example of Tudor architecture. Uh, which was a period in Worcester roughly 1895, 1910. Great combination of elements in the home, six or seven different style windows, many different surface treatments. We have dress stone, undress stone, we have barn board, clapboard, shingle style, red tile. The typical of the style Tudor is the um, uneven roof line, rejections from the roof, and typically also two and a half stories as this one is, projecting pavilions here from the, on both windows. And again, the home actually wraps all the way around to the side. We're taking a look at the Woodland Jepson House, dates from 1913. Architect Lucian Briggs, who also helped design Worcester Auditorium. Uh, the style is Italian Renaissance Revival. Uh, we're looking at the intentionally um, imbalanced or um, asymmetrical side of the house. The side facing Park Ave has an even five bays, which is typical of the Italian Renaissance style. Um, the uh, Port Cochere, which you would, would drive through with your goods and horses, later cars, drop things off. Um, it's a uh, stucco exterior uh, in terracotta, tile roof, again, carefully balanced chimney is above. The small building on the side was the uh, servant's entry. It was added later. There were terraced gardens. In 1926, I believe it was, the Prince of Sweden came here to knight um, Mr. Woodland, who was born in Stockholm and made his money as a bottle manufacturer. Later on, the Jepsons of Norton Company occupied the home, thus the Woodland Jepson House. The Jepson resident at the period, at that time, uh, when he was knighted, his father had also been knighted by the um, Swedish king in Sweden. In the 1940s, the Jepson family willed the property to WPI. Uh, since that time, it has been the residence of uh, WPI's president. Mm -hmm.